أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن المتقين في Translation, as to the righteous, they shall be amidst cool shades and springs of water, and they shall have fruits all they desire. Eat ye and drink ye to your heart's content, for that we have worked righteousness. We welcome Sir James David Bevan, the British High Commissioner to India, Professor S.M. Sajid, Vice Chancellor Jamia Mundi Islamia, colleagues and students of the university. Sir James Bevan joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1982, and he has had a long history of assignments in different parts of the country. He has served in Brussels. He was posted in Paris in 1993, and he was Washington from 94 to 98 as positions of First Secretary Political Military and First Secretary Political, respectively. <laughs> Sir James was also a visiting fellow for Center for International Affairs at Harvard. And he has been the British High Commissioner to India since November 2011. He would be speaking on something which should be at the heart of all the students present here, reasons to be cheerful, why now is the best time to be young. So this is also to inform that Sir James is just a month older than me at 54. <laughs> <laughs> so to be young at 20s would have been <laughs> Uh, I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor S.M. Sajid, to present the plant and scarf to the High Commissioner. request Professor S.M. Sajid to deliver his welcome remarks. Sir James David Bevan, uh, High Commissioner, British High Commissioner to India. Uh, Mr. Marker, Marcus Winsley, Director, Press and Information Group. Uh, my distinguished colleagues and dear students. Uh, since I received the confirmation for this event and also the topic for the talk, I think I have been guessing and trying my hand at understanding the, the topic. And I realized, and that's the beauty of it, I think that reasons to be cheerful, I think, is so and capture the, the diversity of thought 
there can be hundred reasons to be cheerful to hundred different people. And each one of us can find meaning in different things to be cheerful about. And then I was thinking about that why we at Jamia needs to be cheerful at this particular time. And I could find plenty of reasons for that. I think we are very cheerful in Jamia at this moment. One reason is because Sir James is here. Another reason is that we are inching closer to complete 100 years of our existence. And I think that's a very, very important reason. 100 years in the life of an institution is a major milestone. And you know, sir, this is an institution with a difference. It's not that the government of the day decided to open a university and they proposed a bill in the parliament. That stage also came, but much later. It was the mission, it was the passion of nationalist Muslim that they thought they should try to create an institution which will provide, impart secular education not only to Muslims but all the citizens of the country. And if you look at for 42 years, the university survived without a single rupee from any of the government grants. It was only in 1962, 15 years after the independence, that the UGC, University Grants Commission, recognized it as a deemed to be university, and the grants, we started receiving those grants. So you can imagine that to sustain an institution as a university for 42 years without any funds. And it is during this period they, they did some nationally important and wonderful work. So when Gandhiji gave call for a basic education in 1938, Vardha Convention, Dr. Zakir Hussain, former Vice Chancellor and also the former President of India, he took upon himself the responsibility to start a teacher's training college so that the teachers, according to Nai Talim, basic education, can be prepared. Similarly, in 1951, we all are aware that I think the world's largest community development program was started in the country. At that time, Jamia took upon itself the responsibility for establishing an institute of rural services, which at that time used to impart two different diploma programs. One was diploma in rural services, and the other was diploma in civil and rural engineering. The idea was to provide the trained human resources required both in the engineering and the non-engineering sector at different levels so that the community development program can be effectively implemented. Likewise, in 1982, when the first time in the Asian Games, the color broadcast for two hours was started, at that time, the former Vice Chancellor Anwar Jamal Kidwai thought of establishing a mass communication research center to train the people who are into electronic media. So I think that has been the vision of this particular university and its leaders. I'm sure I have 100 other reasons to share with you that why I am and all of us are cheerful in Jamia today. But I'll restrict myself to this because I think the audience is here very keenly, including myself, waiting to hear you, sir. I, I thank you, and we know that we have had very good close relations with you. And many of our department centers, 
are collaborating with several of the universities, but we would certainly like to increase their number. We would like to increase the, uh, the flow of traffic, of scholars, students more importantly, between the two countries. I thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and I hope that we will have frequent occasions like these uh, to interact. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sajid. I now request <coughs> Sir Bevan to kindly deliver his speech to the audience. Professor Sajid, Professor Ashraf, <coughs> other distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, I'm delighted to be here today at this prestigious institution. I'm delighted to see it filled uh, with such talented young people. Uh, my title, as the Vice-Chancellor said, is Reasons to be Cheerful. Why now is the best time to be young? Uh, and let me say to, to my brother, Professor Ashraf, that I think you can be young at 54 as much as you can be young at 20. <laughs> um, let me explain why I think you should be cheerful. It's easy to be a pessimist. You can point to any number of problems in the world today that make life difficult and the future uncertain. And it's much easier to get a story into the media if it's bad news. But I want to try this afternoon to persuade you that the pessimists are wrong. That not only is this a good time to be alive, but that it's the best of all times to be alive. In particular, I want to convince you that it's the best of all times to be you, to be young and to be Indian at the start of the 21st century. I also want to show you, and you would expect this from the British High Commissioner, that it's the best of all times to be British. Now, some of you will have heard of Fred Astaire, the great Hollywood dancer. He was once asked in his later years what he thought of growing old. And he said that it was better than the alternative. Uh, yes. Now, of course, being alive uh, at any time uh, is better than the alternative. But I think that being alive in 2013 is better than at any time in the past. And let me try and explain why. Let's start with something that matters to all of us, health. The first condition of a good life is good health. And in 2013, we humans are healthier than ever before. We're better fed. Uh, the average human eats one third more calories than they did 50 years ago when I was a baby. And the percentage of undernourished people in the world, which was nearly 20% just 10 years ago, is now down to just over 10% today. Fewer mothers die in childbirth. Global maternal mortality has been cut by half since 1990. And fewer children now die in childhood. Since 1960, the mortality rate for children under five has been cut by more than half. And good health means long life. We are living longer than ever before. A 1,000 years ago, the average lifespan of a human was 20 years. The world average today is 67. Life expectancy in this country, India, which was 26 in 1950, had risen to 72 by 2010. And a child born today in Japan can reasonably hope to live to be over 100 years old. We're not only healthier and longer living, we're richer than we have ever been before. The average human now earns three times as much in real terms as 50 years ago. The average Chinese now earns 10 times as much in real terms as they did 50 years ago. And as 
prosperity grows, poverty is going down. The percentage of the world's people who live in absolute poverty has dropped by more than half in the 54 years of my lifetime. In fact, the United Nations estimates that in the past 50 years, the percentage of the world's people living in poverty has been cut by a greater amount than in the previous 500 years. India has been at the forefront of that battle against poverty and has been winning it. So nearly 90%, nearly 9 out of 10 Indians in the 1940s lived in absolute poverty. Today that figure is now down to around 30%. We also have greater freedoms than we ever had before. For most of human history, most people did not get to choose their rulers. That was true even 100 years ago. But today, after the great wave of decolonization and the collapse of totalitarian states, in particular in Europe, democracy is the default. It's the countries that are no longer democracies, that are not democracies, that are now the odd ones out. Indeed. We have more choice than ever before about everything, not just about deciding which government we want, but everything else. So today we are free to choose where we live, what we study, what job we do, what we buy in the shops, who we marry, what clothes we wear, what we do with our leisure time. Now, choice may sometimes be confusing, but like old age, I think it's better than the alternative. The world is also becoming a better place for 50% of its population, women. Now that's not to say that uh, women everywhere don't still face huge challenges which men do not. But through the whole of human history, men have had power that women did not have. And the rights of men have taken precedence over the rights of women. Now that is less and less true in today's world. All over the globe, women are asserting and acquiring rights which men have long taken for granted. The right to work, the right to vote, the right to equal pay, to hold public office, to own property, to education, to serve in the military, to have a bank account, to enter into legal agreements, to decide for themselves whether and who to marry, whether and when they have children. All of those things are rights which women today are acquiring around the world. Even the things that many of us think are bad about the 21st century are actually good. Let me give you a couple of examples. Urbanization. Uh, in 2007, the world crossed uh, a threshold uh, which was little noticed but really important. In 2007, for the first time in human history, there were more people living in cities than living in rural environments. And that's a good thing, because cities are more efficient. People who live in cities take up less space, they use less energy, they have less impact on the natural ecosystems than those who live in the country. Cities are also places, uh, and Delhi is a great example, in which people tend to be more prosperous and in which education and creativity flourish. So cities are not part of the problem that we face in the 21st century. Cities are part of the solution. Let me give you another example, population growth. Um, in my lifetime, the number of people in the world has more than doubled. And that does pose huge challenges. But we should remember that population growth is a sign of success, not failure. It's a consequence of economic growth, progress in technology, in development, and in healthcare, all of which have increased people's life's expectancy. And we should remember, too, that population growth does not automatically mean more poverty. On the contrary, as the global population has grown, people have got richer, not poorer. And although the world's population is continuing to grow, the rate of that increase has been slowing for the last 50 years. Even the environment, which many would say is under greater threat today than at any time in history, I think offers us grounds for optimism. 
we are right to worry about global warming, about pollution, and the depletion of the world's natural resources. They affect everybody, but they impact most of all on the people who can least afford it, on developing countries and poor people. But we should also remember that as countries get richer, and this has certainly happened in my country, they tend to get better at reducing pollution and at managing their resources more efficiently. That's partly because of technology and behavioral change and government regulation, but it's also because markets and electorates increasingly push firms and governments to be greener and more efficient. So nostalgia is overrated, in my view. When um, we compare our lives with those who lived before us, we should remember that what people call the good old days usually were not good. A longing for the past is generally something that is confined to the very few people who were at the top of the tree in the past, the very rich and the very powerful. Most other people who came before us would, I'm sure, be only too happy to swap their lives with ours. In sum, life in 2013 is good. We're richer, healthier, taller, cleverer, longer lived, safer and freer than ever before. So I think we and you can be optimistic because we live at the beginning of the 21st century. We won the lottery of history. And I would argue that as young Indians today, you have won something else. You have won the lottery of geography. You are in the right place in India at the start of the 21st century. Why? Because India possesses strengths and advantages that many other countries don't. Scale. If you want to do something really big, India is the place to do it. India has the money, it has the people, it has the resources to do really big things. Uh, demography, uh, India's young population of which you are uh, a great example, is a huge economic advantage provided that those millions of young people can be given the right education and good jobs. Uh, ambition, energy, talent. Uh, Indians have it in industrial quantities. Uh, creative destruction, the, the force that drives successful progress. Nowhere else uh, do you see more of it than in India. History. Uh, now, India is a country with a long history. That's a good thing. Countries with long histories know how to do things because they've done most of them already in the thousands of years that have gone before. And countries with a rich civilization, like India, can be very confident of meeting future challenges because a country like India has successfully met every single one of the challenges of the past. Uh, knowledge, the, the value that Indian civilization has always placed on knowledge is evident to me today. I see it in the commitment of every Indian parent that I meet, uh, whether rich, poor, or middle class, to get the best possible education for their child. And a society that invests heavily in its children is a society with a bright future. India's vast and growing middle class. That's a force for progress and a force for stability. Uh, unity in diversity. Everywhere I go in India, I see unity in diversity. That is not just a slogan. It's, it's a fact. And it's a huge force for creativity and prosperity. And there's one other advantage that I think India has today over many other parts of the world, which is optimism itself. Now, I know that if you watch the television today or you read the newspapers, you may uh, not see uh, a lot of optimism in the media, but almost every Indian I meet in, in the real India uh, is confident that while today is good, tomorrow will be better. And optimism is a tremendous driver of growth and progress. And India has it by the bucket load. So as you can see, I'm pretty confident uh, after nearly two years here in this country's future. 
uh, I encourage you to be two. Uh, that is for one simple reason. It's not me who is going to build this country's future. It's you. Finally, I said I was here to tell you that I'm confident about the future of another country, my own, Britain. Uh, we in Britain are proud of our past, but we're also confident in our future. We think, in fact, that Britain's best days are still ahead of us. Why do we think that? Well, because Britain, like India, has got some big assets which fit us well for the 21st century. Uh, we are, and intend to remain, one of the world's largest economies. We are, in Britain, the seventh largest economy in the world. Uh, India is currently 11th, with an annual GDP of over $2.4 trillion. That's quite a big economy. Uh, we in Britain think we have the right fundamentals for a successful country. We have a stable democracy, the rule of law, a highly educated workforce, a strong banking system, a business-friendly environment, policies which support growth. Britain is also the place to be if you want to be a global player. London is where the world raises its capital and trades its shares. Uh, the UK is in the right time zone if you want to be a global player because if you're on Greenwich Mean Time, you can talk to Asia in the morning and you can talk to America in the evening. We also have the best connections to the rest of the world. Now, some of you may have been through Heathrow Airport. You may have your own views about Heathrow Airport. Um, but whatever you think uh, about Heathrow Airport, it handles more international flights than any other airport in the world. And of course, in Britain, we speak the world's language, which you do too, English. We're also confident about our future because Britain is a world leader, uh, as India is becoming, in science technology and innovation. Example, uh, the iPad or the iPhone designed by a Brit, uh, the internet invented by one, uh, the Higgs boson, uh, the so-called God particle which explains why the physical world works was predicted by a Brit and discovered earlier this year. And before leaving the Higgs boson, I should also say that the Higgs boson is named not just after Professor Sir Peter Higgs, the Brit, but also after the distinguished Indian physicist, who many of you will know, uh, Satendra Nath Bose. Uh, other things which uh, we in Britain have discovered or invented include, uh, in no particular order, football, <coughs> golf, uh, cricket, tiddlywinks, croquet, Railways, steam engines, hovercraft, penicillin, gravity, longitude, the jet engine, evolution, the postage stamp, uh, and most important, sticky toffee pudding. Uh, all of those things and more have been invented in my country. That's not bad for a small misty island off the coast of Europe. Uh, we're confident too because Britain is a world leader in education and research. There are many lists of top universities in the world. Uh, the most recognized one uh, lists the top 10 universities, of which four are British. Uh, we have produced over 100 Nobel Prize winners in my country. That is more than any other country in the world except the United States. Uh, we can do difficult things well in Britain. Uh, example, last year's London Olympics, which I hope many of you watched, delivered on time, on budget, with friendliness, with good humor, and a bit of style. Uh, featuring two of our greatest icons, Her Majesty the Queen and James Bond jumping out of a helicopter together. We're confident too because Britain has a tolerant society uh, at ease with itself. It's multi-faith, it's multi-ethnic, and almost all people in Britain are very proud to be British. Now, I think that's a powerful list. But I would say that, wouldn't I, because I'm the British High Commissioner and I'm paid to say positive things about Britain. <laughs> so my proposal is that you don't take my word for it, that Britain is attractive. I would instead encourage you to take the word of your fellow Indians. And the fact is that 
Indians seem to think rather highly of Britain. Uh, we have about one and a half million people of Indian origin living in Britain. Uh, we have more than 20,000 Indian students a year who come to Britain to study in British universities. That's the second largest group of foreign students after the Chinese. Indians don't just want to study in Britain, they want to visit Britain. We get over 400,000 a year of Indian visitors to the United Kingdom. And Indians want to do business with Britain. They invest more in the UK than Indians invest in the whole of the rest of the European Union put together. So we must be doing something right. Let me conclude by saying uh, that I am an optimist, uh, that one reason to be an optimist is that it's good for you. Uh, medical studies show that pe people who have a positive outlook on life live longer. Um, business studies show that people who have an optimistic outlook are more prosperous and more successful than those who don't. But as I've tried to show you today, I think there's a better reason to be an optimist about the world, about India and about Britain, and that is simply that being an optimist is justified by the facts. Either way, uh, my message to you this afternoon is very simple. Smile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Bevan. And now I request Professor Sajid to please coordinate the question and answer session. Uh, I think there is so much of negativity all around that we at times tend to be blocked out. But I would <coughs> look at the brighter side also, which is I think really, really important to not only sustain us, but also to keep us going and improve the situation for the future. Okay. Uh, the world will be even better than uh, today. Uh, now the floor is open for the uh, questions. I would request that whosoever asks the question first, briefly introduce yourself and be very, very precise in the question. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the German Media Slavia. I am Anupama Thomas and I am from the Faculty of Education. Uh, I really appreciate your views uh, about the, the topic, the, the ones that you cited. But at the very outset, you stated certain statistics. At the very outset, you uh, stated uh, certain statistics regarding uh, the longevity and how the health and uh, the economic conditions of people have improved over the years. But uh, I do not agree with certain aspects of that, especially regarding the health aspect, because uh, you, uh, I mean, I have come across uh, various statistics in the newspapers recently that there have been many young people uh, below the age of 30 years who have succumbed to strokes or have become uh, uh, patients of uh, diabetes or stress. So uh, I feel that. Uh, Health, uh, as far as health is concerned, probably we are uh, going off or not on the right track, probably because of stress or other related conditions. So, what do you have to say to that? Thank you. That uh, you can prove anything with statistics, so you, you're right to be skeptical about some of them. Um, I did get the statistics checked by my experts before I made the speech, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily right. Um, more seriously, that I think we can agree that uh, the overall trend historically is, is for people to uh, live healthier lives and live longer, and that's a great thing, and we should celebrate that, but not be complacent, because as you say, Vice Chancellor, there's always more we can do to improve health and improve the quality and the length of life. Um, I think you're right that as we have um, battled some of the most serious threats to health, like malnutrition, which is arguably the biggest of all threats to anyone's health, a malnourished mother produces a malnourished child, which will then produce a malnourished baby. Um, while we have tackled those and are tackling those successfully, uh, there are new health threats that are arising because of the way that we live now. And India would be a good example. I'm sure that um, 
uh, you know, uh, people who now live in fast-paced urban environments experience, I guess, more stress than people who live peacefully in the countryside. Although, again, I know that sometimes it can be stressful operating in rural areas. Uh, it's true too, isn't it, that some of the health problems that we're seeing now are, if you like, the problems of success. Indian health problems uh, in the areas like diabetes or uh, obesity are the result of the fact that Indian society is becoming wealthier and that people are able to eat richer foods sometimes and maybe take less exercise. So I think, uh, I think I agree with you that we should be skeptical about all the statistics. I think we both agree that uh, the overall picture is getting better, but I would agree with you too that there are new health threats that we need to collaborate together to, to beat. Jim, I'd like to ask you, um, do you know who made the world's first university? <laughs> is, it, is this a trick question? Yeah. Because the answer is no. <laughs> right. Uh, if you ever get time, you can check it on uh, Wikipedia, and it's from the Guinness World Books of Records. Okay. It was made uh, by a Muslim lady named Fatima Al-Fahri. Uh -huh. it was, it, it's in Fez, Morocco, and it still gives degrees. Uh -huh. So uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, I mean, Islam gave rights to women, like you said, to, to, you know, to um, study or to work. So Islam gave that rights out of them, and they made the, the universities from their own pockets for I mean, hundreds, thousands of years ago. So, coming to the question, you said that uh, you know poverty is decreasing. I mean, I think poverty is not decreasing, but it is being deliberately, you know, the figures are being uh, shown less because uh, we can see our politicians, they are, you know, uh, uh, jiggling with their definition of poverty, right? They say even um, a couple of 500 bucks is enough for a family of five for a month, I think it's a joke. So, I mean, uh, even I mean, 80% of Indians live below poverty line. Where this can easily be, it can easily be tackled where lakhs of tons of food greens are being, going, I mean, are being wasted. And uh, we can uh, see that in, in the name of price control, we drain food greens and there's inflation. So what is the solution which you can propose to this? Okay, thank you. Um, on the definition of poverty, I'm very aware that uh, that, that is a subject of some controversy in India. Um, so I'm not going to get into the issue of the Indian definition of poverty. What I will say is that there is a, an, an agreed UN definition of poverty, of extreme poverty, which is living on less than $1.25 a day. And the figures that I gave were related to that UN world definition of poverty. Um, and what they show is that uh, although there is still huge poverty in the world, that, as I think I said over the last decades, that the proportion of the world's population living in poverty has reduced. And that's a great thing that we should celebrate. Um, but one person living in poverty is too much. And there is a long way to go before we eradicate poverty from the world. But that's, I think that's a noble ambition. And the work of the Department for International Development, who have uh, very big cooperation programs here in uh, some of the Indian states, is precisely designed to do that. It's about ending poverty. Um, what's the solution? I think the long-term solution to ending poverty is growth. It's creating uh, economic growth, greater prosperity, um, more jobs and better jobs for all who want them. Um, and that takes a long time and it requires the right policies. But you know, I mentioned China, where you, where you have had successful growth over a long period, um, although the effects are uneven, you know, growth, growth does better things for some people than others. Uh, overall, growth, what growth seems to do is reduce poverty. So the long-term solution is growth. Uh, if I've learned one other thing, uh, I've spent quite a lot of my time on development in my career. If there is one, uh, one thing you can do to, uh, to fight poverty and promote development. If there's just one single thing that you were going to do, it is to educate girls. It has a tremendous uh, effect in all spheres, not just in terms of girls' education, but in terms of the welfare of the family, um, uh, the welfare of society, and economic growth. So, as I say, if there's one solution, let's educate every girl in the world. I'm Yusuf Hassan from Faculty of Engineering. I'm currently third year of Computer Engineering. Sir, so sticking to the topic of the talk, 
and you mentioned that we need to be optimistic. Sir, uh, citing personal example, of, citing personal example of my own, uh, if a person is of moderate resources, he he or even she is made aware of the responsibilities that the individual is going to face in the near future. Even I know my responsibilities. I know that there might be a hurdle for higher education. I have to get placed somewhere. So, sir, what is the at what is the best time for me to be young? Was it the time when I was not made aware of my responsibilities? I did not know I enjoyed it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Or is it today the best time to be young because I know what I have to achieve in life? Or the best time for me will be that pinnacle of success when I will definitely do something? What will be the right time for me to be young? I, I don't know the answer to that. You do. Uh, but, but I guess the best time to be alive is now, is whenever. You know, now, today is a great day. Let's celebrate that. Tomorrow will be even better. Yes, you. Uh, sir, uh, do you think uh, getting better uh, is an, uh, getting worse is also uh, an evolving process like getting better? Uh, with, uh, with growth, we uh, get inequality free. Uh, with, uh, like you said, that we have the right to marry whichever you want or whoever you want. Then we have honor killing for free. Uh, with uh, uh, growth of technology, we get radicalization of youth and terrorism for free. So do you think getting worse is also an evolving process like getting better? Yes, I think that change is always painful. And for every upside, for every positive, there's a downside and there's a negative or a risk. Um, but I, I think that humankind has shown that it can overcome those risks, provided we work together uh, in good faith. I mentioned some of the risks that I see in front of us now. Global warming is a good example. Um, that will, unless we stop dangerous global warming, that will, that will hurt the poorest people of the world. Uh, and we have to deal with it. And that is a consequence of progress. It's a consequence in particular of um, economic development in the Western world and the use of hydrocarbons to power that development. So that's a very good example of, of what you're talking about, that there are downsides to every positive. I guess the other thing I'd say is that, um, in my experience, I don't know if it's true for you, um, bad things can be good if you learn from them. Uh, you know, most of the things that I've learned as a human and as certainly as a diplomat, I've learned by making mistakes. And I think the issue for us as humans is, is not um, do we make mistakes, because that's what humans do. The issue is do we learn? from those mistakes. So I think even, even things that are bad, even things that are sad, uh, things that you would not like to happen, can be turned into something positive if you draw the right lesson. Yes, Hello, sir. My name is Harim I'm from Afghanistan. My question refers to you uh, that uh, you talked really well for my talk. You mentioned many reasons to be cheerful and happy. But still there are like many reasons which not let us to live cheerful and happy. Did I mention some of them? Uh, the first one is the British stance in nowadays, uh, the British stance for supporting the CC and with, with his army, who is fighting against an elected democracy and against Musi, which is uh, mercy an elected democracy. This is fine that. So the British stand against that they did not even declare that uh, the army which has a martial law or something against the uh, mercy is wrong. I mean being silent is a type of support of that. And second, uh, my second question is that uh, about the reservation. Reservation is an employment and job for Indian. British has decreased it more than by 30 or 20 percent by every year. So if you are decreasing, if we do not believe in coexistence, you are not giving chance to them. So how will this young generation evolve? Okay, th thank you. On Egypt, and I guess there's a broader question there about the Arab Spring, more generally. I think uh, what's happening in the in the Arab world is something of huge importance that we all need to to pay attention to. I think that the Arab Spring is a good thing. I think you're seeing generations, a generation, a young generation, people of your age. Uh, around uh, the Arab world who are, have been frustrated with the lack of economic opportunity, 
am frustrated that they have no voice, uh, frustrated that the governments uh, under which they live have not reflected their own views. And you know, as someone who believes in democracy, and, and you know, India is a great place to talk about democracy because it is a great democracy, the world's biggest, I think it is a good thing that people get to choose their own government and get to express their own views. Uh, and to the extent that we see uh, that happening in the Arab Spring, that's something that we welcome. You asked about Egypt. Um, we don't support um, military um, coups. We don't support military dictatorships. What we want to see in Egypt is uh, a rapid end to the violence, uh, the beginning of a political process uh, in which the key players will talk to each other, uh, leading as soon as possible to uh, fresh elections that will produce a democratically elected government that can uh, deliver the will of the Egyptian people. Uh, and that's our, our aim and hope in, in Egypt. Um, I think your last question was about, was it about the reduction in the number of yeah, students? Reservation for Indians in the British. In the British, in the British. Oh, I see. OK, yes. OK. So um, we are, the first thing to say about uh, Indians in Britain is that uh, we welcome all uh, Indians who want to visit, who want to study, who want to do business in Britain, uh, and who want to work in Britain and meet the, the migration rules. And the second thing to say is that most Indians who apply for a visa to come to Britain get one. Nine out of 10 Indians who apply get a visa to come to the UK. Uh, that's actually a better uh, uh, number than if you applied to, say, America or Germany or France. So we're open and we welcome all legitimate uh, Indian and other foreign uh, visitors to the UK. What we have done is um, produce, we have not limited the numbers of uh, Indians who can come as students. There's no limit, uh, provided you have uh, a place at a British university and provided you speak basic English, you can come. Uh, we have not limited the numbers of Indian visitors uh, who can uh, come to the UK. Um, there is a limit on the number of skilled workers who can come to Britain, which applies not just to India but to the whole, to countries coming uh, from around the world. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, we have enough skilled workers, more or less, uh, in Britain at the moment, and we don't want to uh, deprive our own workers of jobs by admitting uh, others. There are exceptions to that rule. Where there are skills that we don't have or we don't have in enough numbers, we still do uh, admit uh, Indians and anyone else with the skills. And a good example would be um, the IT industry. So uh, we have had a, we had a debate a year or so ago about whether we should put a limit uh, on the numbers of people who come to Britain uh, to work for Indian companies. So an Indian company, Wipro here, for example, wants to send someone to Britain to work there. And we decided that we would place no limit on the numbers. So uh, any uh, Indian who meets the qualifications, uh, who is being sent to Britain uh, as part of a company transfer, will get their visa. Yes, you can, and it's already happened. Uh, we, you're right that last year we changed the rules about uh, the ability of students, not just Indian students, but any foreign students who came to Britain to work. Previously, uh, if you were a foreign student and you finished your university uh, course in Britain, you had the right to work for uh, two years in the UK um, in any job. And we changed that because, again, we have unemployment in the UK. We were concerned that foreign uh, students were, if you like, taking jobs that unemployed British people wanted. And so we ended that provision. However, and this is the important point, we've replaced it with something that I think is better. And the situation now is that 
If you're an Indian student and you study at a British university, you can uh, remain in the UK to work, uh, not just for two years, but for a total of six years, three years plus another three years if you reapply. So you can stay for six years, and the only uh, condition is that you have to get a graduate level job. So not a low paid, unskilled job, but a job at graduate level, and there's a salary threshold, which is the average wage actually in the UK, which determines whether the job is a graduate level job. And those jobs are precisely the kind of jobs that I would expect people like you, you know, talented Indian professionals, to get in the UK. So I think that uh, we've improved the situation, uh, and I think that you will find that uh, Indian students who want to stay and work in the UK, provided they have those qualifications, will be free to do so, and we welcome them. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for taking the questions and for giving very, very frank answers. I hand over the proceedings to Soumya for a vote of thanks. Um, thank you for inviting me, sir. A very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, it is my deep honor to offer a formal vote of thanks to His Excellency, Sir James David Bevan, British High Commissioner to India, who's taken out time to, from his otherwise busy schedule to be with us today here in Jamia. And sir, we are really grateful to you for sharing your thoughts, ideas, and optimism with all of us. And we are also grateful to your office for listening with us. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend thanks to our esteemed Vice Chancellor, Professor S. M. Sajib and our Registrar, Professor Shahid Ashraf, for their consistent encouragement and guidance. I thank their officers for their support as well. We would also like to extend gratitude to the respective deans, heads, directors, and all the teachers for being present here during this program. I also thank AJK MCRC and all the media persons, the lovely media persons, for being present today. I must also thank the Jamia Millia Islamia Administration the Office of the Outreach Program, the Center for Information Technology, the Proctor's Office, and the Department of Sanitation and Horticulture for their untiring support. I would also like to thank all the students for being a part of this program, for asking some very, very pertinent questions and uh, getting good answers from Sir here. And uh, having said that, I would like to invite all of you for some high tea outside. Thank you. Thank you.